Well, good evening, everyone. Good evening, Camp Meeting Church family. Happy Tuesday. Oh, man, there was only one amen over here. Only one person had a nice Tuesday. Did you have a good day? You know, it, it's uh, beginning to warm up. We had a, a nice cool week uh, last week, but it's beginning to warm up. But, you know, I went for a walk today and I even took a nap. So it's a good Tuesday. That doesn't happen too often. So we need to get ourselves into the attitude of worship. We need to worship our Lord through song, and we're going to start that tonight. Um, you know, uh, at, at my church, uh, over the last year or so, I have been uh, preaching on salvation, of what it means to be saved. We've been talking a lot about righteousness by faith. And you know, the, the fact of the matter is, salvation is possible only because God loved us so much that he gave the best that he had in Jesus, and because of that, we have salvation. Amen? And it, it was on that cross that Jesus paid our debt. We should be the ones hanging on that cross, paying our debt of sin, but Jesus decided to take our place, and he paid for our debt. And, that's because, and because of that, we have salvation. Because of that, our sins have been forgiven. Because of that, there's a light at the end of the tunnel for us. And so it all started at the cross. And so let's sing number 163, At the Cross. At the cross, number 163. Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my Sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred heat for someone such as I? At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. I can't hear you. Was it for crimes that I have done? He suffered on the tree. Amazing pity, grace unknown, and love beyond degree. Where did it happen? I saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. But drops of grief can ne'er repay the debt of love I owe. Here, Lord, I give myself away. Tis all that I can do. Come on, sing it. And now I am happy all the day. We can be happy, amen? And because what Jesus did on the cross, do you know we can be sure of our salvation? We can have assurance. Can we have assurance? See, we don't, we don't have to be walking around with our heads down. And somebody asks us, are you saved? And somebody will say, well, I'm trying. I I'm working on it. No, we, we can be sure of our salvation because it does not depend upon us, but upon everything that Jesus already accomplished for us at the cross. We can have assurance, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine, number 462. Blessed assurance. Jesus is mine, for what a foretaste of glory divine, heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. Tell me your story. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior. This is my story, this is 
my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight, visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Angels descending bring from above echoes of mercy, whispers of love. So they can hear it outside. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I am my Savior, and happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above. Filled with his goodness, lost in his love. Come on again. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. And now that we have the assurance of salvation, we know that one day soon, Jesus is coming to take us home. He said it in John 14, I will come again. And if we look at what's happening around us, we have to come to the conclusion that Jesus is coming soon. That he is going to take us home in a little while. Not long from now. In a little while, we're going home. Number 626. sing a song that will cheer us by the way in a little while we're going home for the night will end in the everlasting day in a little while we're going home in a little while in a little while we shall cross the billows foam shall meet at last when the stormy winds are past in a little while we're going home we will do the work that our hand may find to do in a little while we're going home and the grace of God will our daily strength renew in a little while we're going home. When are we going home? Come on. In a little while, in a little while, we shall cross the billows foam. We shall meet at last when the stormy winds are past. In a little while we're going home. We will smooth the path for some weary, weary feet in a little while we're going home. And may loving hearts spread around an influence sweet in a little while we're going home. I'm going in a little while. Are you joining me? In a little while, we shall cross the billows foam. We shall meet at last when the stormy winds are past. In a little while we're going home. There's a rest beyond, there's relief from every care. In a little while we're going home. And no tears shall fall in that city bright and fair. In a little while we're going home. While we 
shall cross the billows foam. We shall meet at last when the stormy winds are past. In a little while we're going home. And I can't wait. How about you? Amen. Good evening, all you beautiful Kentucky 10 camp meeting families out here. Looks so nice to see all of you there. Let's uh, bow our heads together as we begin this evening's meeting and ask the Lord to send a reinforcement of holy angels. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your power. We thank you for the angels, Lord, and their protection, as uh, Dr. Derek Moore shared with us night after night. And we just pray that you'll cover us, Lord, with that righteousness of Christ and that canopy of protection, and that the evil angels will not be able to come into this house, but that your Holy Spirit will be felt by all tonight, and that we'll be drawn near to heaven. We ask a special outpouring upon Richie as he bring us, brings us a message that you've placed on his heart. And we pray that you'll bless the offerings and the tithes that we give to you this evening. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to stand with me as we sing our theme song, We Are His Children. We are His children, the fruit of His suffering, saved and redeemed by His blood. Called to be holy alike to the nations, clothed with His power. 
filled with his love. Go forth in his name proclaiming Jesus reigns. Now is the time for the church to arise and proclaim him Jesus, Savior, Redeemer, and Lord. Oh, go forth in his name proclaiming Jesus reigns. Now is the time for the church to arise and proclaim him Jesus, Savior, Redeemer, and Lord. Listen, the wind of the Spirit is blowing the end of all ages is so near. Powers in the earth and the heavens are shaking. Jesus our Lord soon shall appear. Go forth in his name proclaiming. Jesus reigns. Now is the time for the church to arise and proclaim him. Jesus, Savior, Redeemer, and Lord. Oh, go forth in his name, proclaiming Jesus reigns. Now is the time for the church to arise and proclaim him. Jesus, Savior, Redeemer, and Lord. You may be seated. Good evening. I get to be the Women's Ministries Director and Prayer Ministries Director for the Kentucky Tennessee Conference, and I count that a real privilege. I would have loved to have had some pictures to show you, but instead of that, I thought I'd bring the real thing. So what I want is for every woman in this auditorium to stand up. Come on, up, 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 every woman, not men. Women, I want all the women, okay? This is women's ministries. Are you looking around? Okay, you may be seated, thank you. That's better than a picture any day, right? It's the real thing. There were three women who I believe were bowed in grief as they walked away from a place that had been their home. And as they made their way, I imagine that all three of them were thinking of the great loss that they had suffered. And one of them specifically, and that was Naomi. She had lost not just two sons, but also her husband. And the picture that you see in the beginning of the book of Ruth are these three women kind of just hanging on to each other. It says that in verse 9, she says she kissed them and they wept aloud. I want you to picture these women weeping because they have suffered loss. Verse 10, and they said to her, Naomi, we will go back with you to your people. They gathered around Naomi. They were not going to leave her. And Naomi said, but return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Three times she told them to return home. There was one that did, we know that in verse 14, at this they wept again because of the words that Naomi had said about the Lord's hand has gone out against me. And then Oprah, Oprah excuse me, kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. That word clung is gorilla glue. It is, can't get off, can't. Can't, can't break it away. It's the same word that God used in Genesis 2 for a man and a woman to cleave together. Ruth was not going to leave her mother-in-law. And then we have these famous words, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if anything but death separates you and me. Those words represent us as we declare our loyalty to Jesus. 
We don't want to leave him. We want to cling to him. But, you know, women have a unique uh, ability to really bond with each other. There's something about our makeup, isn't there, Heather? <laughs> and, you know, we can, one thing about women that I absolutely love, you can maybe go months or years or a long time, and you've not seen, oh, it's been three years since we've been here to camp meeting. I bet you have seen some women here that you have not seen in three years, and guess what? It's just like it was yesterday, right? And you're like, oh, yeah, well, what's happened? Oh, man, yes, that was great. You know we like to talk. You know that. So that's a really great thing about women, too. But this past few years have been a difficult one for all ministries. But I am proud to say that the women here in Kentucky, Tennessee, did not fail in reaching out to Jesus and in reaching out to others. We've had multiple Zoom meetings. We have had some Bible studies that I've been able to be involved in throughout these several couple, two, two and a half years, I guess. We've had a prayer group that I've had the privilege of meeting with every Sunday morning. We've only missed, I believe, two or three Sunday mornings for almost going on three years. That's three years we have continued to pray for every need that came before us and answers that have come that bring great joy. Women's Ministries is about women discipling each other to know and show Jesus. So what have we done in the last three years? Well, we, this last year we had a leadership training. We have a praying, what was originally praying for your husband, and now it's, it's inclusive. It's us women praying for our families. That will be coming up in June. We've had two spring retreats last year and this year. We have had a fall retreat, over 200 women that came to our fall retreat. And I want you to know, guys out there, that there were women that did the zip line. And we had some 80-year-olds do the zip line. So I want you to know, they were out there doing horseback riding and boat riding and, and everything that we had available on our Friday afternoon mosaics. I wish you could see them. We also um, have had... Uh, something that's been unique that has come our way. I had the privilege uh, a year ago of being invited to speak virtually. <laughs> Not, I wish I could have gone then. But uh, to a group of women in Ireland. I became acquainted with the mission uh, couple there. And Pam, Gideon's wife, invited me to do this virtual retreat, which I did. Last fall, I then had the opportunity to do a Bible study with about 10 lovely Irish women. And we really got to know each other. And Pam said, Gail, I know what we need to do. You need to bring some women over here to get, do a retreat here in Ireland. Well, I just thought that's crazy, you know, still with COVID and whatnot. But guess what? In just about what, Rochelle, how, much, how many days do we have left? Well, two weeks, two weeks from tomorrow. We will be, 31 of us, 36 altogether, will be on a plane and headed to Dublin, Ireland, where we will be doing a women's retreat for Northern Ireland Mission. They already have over 40 women that will be attending with our 36. Is that, can you say amen to that? And included in that are four Ukrainian refugee women that just are going to come on board. We're still looking for a Russian translator. Um, I got Alex in the wings. Might have to put him on Zoom. But um, this is really exciting for our women to connect with the women in Ireland. And the next great thing is that those women then we want to bring next year to our retreat and to here to Tennessee. And I wish it was during camp meeting. Maybe I need to do that. <laughs> but we're very excited about that. You know, there are many things that women do that are never acknowledged. And I have to acknowledge tonight my team. Um, I'm not going to name all of their names. April is my assistant, does amazing things. But I could name, I see Heather here, I see Rochelle, I know Diane, I know Carol, I've got what about, Vera, Marilyn, Sue, Di uh, Sarah, Melissa, Carmen, Gwen, Anne, Mary, so many women who are in my life, 
who have enriched my life so much, and I am so grateful for that. Not too many years ago, I was at the Southern Union departmental meetings, and the Kentucky-Tennessee conference takes everybody out to eat. And I was in my car with my GPS, and I was trying to find where they all were. I was by myself. Anybody been in a GPS circle? <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> Wasn't that fun? In the dark. Go down this road. Ding, 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 ding. Recalculating, recalculating. Ding, 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 ding. Recalculating, recalculating. I literally was in tears. And I will just tell you, I gave up. I gave up, turned around, went back to my hotel room and cried. Well, I didn't really cry, but I was like, that's it. I can't do it anymore. It may have felt like that these past couple of years. Like we don't know what's coming next and we don't know what direction we're going. But my dear friend Con Arnold, years ago, every time you left his side, would always say, straight ahead. That's right, you remember that. This is our theme for this year. And here's the text that goes with it from Philippians 3, verses 13 and 14. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing, and you know the I do is not in this. It's just one thing. But one thing, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. That's women's ministries straight ahead. Good evening, everyone. Just thought for that we would take a minute or two and just consider the call that God has given us uh, as Seventh-day Adventists, the main objective of our church, the Seventh-day Adventist church. And I want to share a couple of verses with you that come to mind. Um, in Matthew 28, you're familiar with these verses. Uh, Jesus said, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. And then in Matthew 24 and verse 14, Jesus said this. He said, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then the end shall come. 19 years ago, if it wasn't for evangelism, for God's people answering that call, I wouldn't be here today. My wife would not be an active Seventh-day Adventist. Neither would my three children be Adventists. If it wasn't for evangelism. You know, Ellen White said this, um, this is in Evangelism, page 16. She said, We are now living in the closing scenes of this world's history. Let men tremble with the sense of their responsibility of knowing the truth. The ends of the world are coming. Proper consideration of these things will lead all to make an entire consecration of all that they have and are to their God. You know, evangelism does a lot of things in your local church. Uh, we're preparing, by God's grace, for a fall evangelistic series in the Murfreesboro Church that I pastor. Tullahoma Church, the other church that I have, uh, very active. We have hired a Bible worker. Evangelism funds provide uh, for that Bible worker and for the seed-sowing events uh, that we're actively involved in. And so I want to make an appeal um, before our prayer that you would consider the importance and the goal of our church as you consider giving the, to evangelism. Let's, let's bow our heads. Loving Father, we're thankful that you have given us a new day of life, that you have called us to be part of this great commission. What a privilege it is, Lord, to, to partner with you to work to save souls for eternity. 
And so, Father, give us, through your Holy Spirit, the desire to give sacrificially to really the heart of uh, the church today, which is to give to evangelism so that we can bring the three angels' message to the entire world. And thank you for that privilege, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our ushers will be around uh, to make a collection. Thank you. Good evening, friends. I get to talk to you for a moment about prayer, and I do just have a really exciting thing to share with you guys. Um, I was asked to come to the juniors department and have prayer time with them every day and um, teach them, if they didn't know already, how to pray um, united prayer, we call it. And I'm not sure if you know what that is, but essentially it's group prayer where we go through um, praise, confession, supplication, and thanksgiving. And um, it's just a beautiful way to pray in a group. So I made up some cards, color-coded cards for the kids to give them an idea of how, how we do this. And so Monday, yesterday, about 20 kids at a time together, so a nice group of kids, we would pray through these sections of prayer. And prayer time would last about 30 minutes, juniors. And so let me just give you an example. So for praise, um, an idea, just a quick short prayer. I praise you as the rock of my salvation. You are a mighty fortress and nothing can overpower you, God. For confession, God, I confess that I do not spend the time talking with you that I should. Teach me how to pray so that you can do wonderful things in my life. For supplication, and we, we called it asking. Father, we live in a world where we are taught to do what seems right to us. I ask you to teach me your ways on what is right to do. Fill my mind with your thoughts and fill my body with your strength to do it. And then for thankfulness. Lord, thank you for promising that you will never abandon me. No matter how I feel inside or what is going on around me, you have promised to be with me. Help me to trust your word over how I feel or what I see. 
So this was Monday. We kind of practiced with these cards and prayed together. Well, this morning, the Lord put it on my heart that the kids don't need to read something. Let's just pray. So we put these cards away. And we gathered together closely. And we started with a song. And I'm telling you, these kids... Lord, I praise you that you're my that you sent Jesus to die for me. Lord, I praise you that you're making a home for me in heaven. Lord, I praise you that my family's here at camp meeting. I'm telling you, it was so beautiful. And then we went through each section. And it was just, just warmed my heart completely. And so what to do with all these cards I had made? So the Lord whispered, they should share a prayer. So I don't know if you've seen any of these cards around campus, but if you see someone that looks like they're about in juniors, just ask them, are you in juniors? Do you have a prayer to share? Because they all have pockets full of these cards. And I just hope it's a blessing to them. Friends, if there's anything we can do to hasten Jesus coming back, it is to pray and pray together. So anyway, I um, am just so thankful that these, these kids are just coming before our Father and learning how to ask for what they need and to praise Him and to thank Him and confess. So um, if you'll join me now, let us ask the Lord to bless our evening. Heavenly Father, I just... Thank you so much for the opportunity to be together as a family to worship you tonight. And Lord, if we could ask for anything, it is your Holy Spirit to fill this room. Lord, I pray that you fill our hearts, open our ears that we may hear you. Lord, we pray that you just fill our friend Richie with your words, Lord. We want to see Jesus tonight. We want to see him in all his beauty and be drawn to him, Lord. And we want to let the things of this world just go. Lord, um, again, I just praise you and thank you for gathering us here. We ask your blessing on each meeting happening all over campus, Lord. We just thank you and ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to open your Bibles to Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11. And we'll read together verse 35. Hebrews 11, verse 35. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. There were others who were tortured, refusing to be released, so that they might gain an even better resurrection. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Well, good evening. Now, come on now. You know me better than that. You know I'm not going to go for that. Good evening. Are we excited to be at camp meeting or what? I know I am. I love camp meeting. I love the spiritual feast that we're getting to enjoy here. Day after day, the powerful sermons, incredible. We know I have the privilege tonight of introducing our speaker. And how many here have heard or heard in the past Ron Halverson Sr. preach? Anybody heard him? Yeah, I see a lot of hands going up. Wasn't he a powerful preacher? Incredibly powerful preacher. So engaged. I felt like I was always sitting on the edge of my seat when I was listening to him talk because he had so many stories of things he had went through and things he had done. You know, when I listen to Richie, I almost kind of feel like I'm listening to his uncle, Ron Halverson Sr. I know as well his cousin very well, Ron Halverson Jr. We served in President's Council together in the Columbia Union. Incredible family, incredible people. You know, most recently, I got to meet Richie through my aunts. I've got two aunts that were part of his church in Bowman Hills, the Bowman Hills Church. And they told me, you got to hear our preacher. He's incredible, Mike. He's incredible. And sure enough, you tune in and wow, 
And what an incredible speaker. And, you know, Richie's become a friend. When I called him up, he immediately said, yes, I would love to come and speak at camp meeting. So praise God. We're so glad he's here tonight. We're going to hear him come up and speak to us momentarily. God bless you. Good evening. My name is Elda Bufartike, and I will be singing Hold On to the Gospel Plow. Well, I got my hands on the gospel plow. Wouldn't take nothing for my journey now. Keep your hands on that plow over God. Hold on, hold on, hold on to that plow, hold on. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all of them prophets are dead and gone. Keep your hands on the plow of God. Hold on, hold on, hold on to the plow, hold on. Sister Mary was bound in chains, all of them chains but Jesus' name. Keep your hand on that plow, over oh, God. Hold on, hold on, hold on to that plow. Hold on, I've never been to heaven, but I've been told the streets up there are made of gold. Keep your hands on that plow. Oh, God, hold on, hold on, hold on to that plow, hold on, hold on. Plow and hold on. Amen. 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 Hold on. That spoke to my heart. Praise the Lord. God is good. Amen. What a blessing it's been to be with you yesterday and now today, to have the privilege to be able to meet many of you and pray with many of you and just praise God for each and every one of you. Uh, this, again, is the closest place that this preacher's boy can call home, and it's just always a blessing to be able to be here at home uh, and to be a part of camp meeting and appreciate uh, the Kentucky Tennessee Conference and uh, Elder Hewitt for the invitation to be able to come. Uh, appreciate his leadership and each of our pastors and leaders here. Let's have a word of prayer as we get into God's word. Most gracious God, we thank you, we praise you for the awesome God that you are. 
And Lord, I just pray that you would just speak to each and every one of us here tonight. That Lord, your spirit would fill this place that we might leave here as new people because we have been with Jesus. And I just pray for the outpouring of your spirit to fill each life. That you would rebuke the enemy and cast his influence down. And that we might grow in Christ Jesus tonight. In his name we pray, amen. Find it interesting that as you study the Gospels and you look at the different stories that Jesus very often appears to show up when it's too late. In John eleven seventeen, it says, Now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. And in John eleven thirty nine, 39, Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. Now many scholars believe that the Holy Spirit inspires John. He, he's putting that four day in increment there for a reason. That he puts the four days there to reiterate to the reader that Lazarus was definitely dead. Because there was a belief during this time that the life-giving breath of God actually hovered over the body and near the body for three days. That many of the people during this time believed that within that three day period there was still a chance that someone could come back. That there was still a chance that someone could be revived or resuscitated. But after three days went by there was no hope of ever coming back. And here's the thing, this was not the only time that Jesus seems to show up too late. And maybe in your own life, you've, you've felt at times like, God, where were you when I needed you? Why didn't you show up in my child's life when I prayed for it? And here again in Mark 5, we've got a ruler of the synagogue by the name of Jairus. And Jairus comes to Jesus because his daughter is ill. But it seems as though Jesus keeps taking his time. Jairus is the ruler of the synagogue and he's trying to get Jesus coming. Come on, Jesus. But Jesus keeps getting distracted. He seems to take his own time. Even stopping to heal an unclean woman along the way. Until we read in Mark 5, 35, while he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house some who said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? And here I'm sure Jairus thought, Jesus, you're too late. Sometimes when I read the Bible, it seems as though Jesus often doesn't show up until it's too late. Martha says to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. You see, what you've got here is Martha is scolding God. And, and what's interesting about Martha is Martha is often scolding God. You know, she gets on to him at another time when she's busy in the kitchen doing all the work and her sister is sitting at the feet of Jesus. You know, she scolds God there too. You see, Martha is scolding God. I wonder, has anyone here ever scolded God? Why didn't you come when I asked you to come? Why didn't you intervene when I asked you to intervene? Why did you not deliver when I asked you to deliver, you're too late, God. Lazarus is dead. My child is dead. My relationships are dead. My finances are dead. And I've discovered the reason why God often arrives too late is because he wants no debate as to who performed the miracle. In Mark 5, 36, notice it says... Upon, upon overhearing, let me see if I can find the verse, 
Upon overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, do not fear, only believe. In John eleven forty, 40, he tells Martha, Jesus says to her, did I not tell you that if you believe, you would see the glory of God? You see, this is the thing we've got to understand about our God, is that four days or 4,000 4,000 years is the same thing to God. You see, for Jesus, death is nothing more than taking a nap. Hallelujah, with Christ there is no expiration date. Amen? (laughs) With Jesus there is no expiration date. Jesus always arrives exactly when he intends to. And so Jesus simply says, where have you laid him? I believe Jesus is asking us the same thing tonight. He's asking, where have you laid him? Where have you laid your hopes, your dreams? Where have you laid your passion for mission? Where have you laid your passion for the church? Where have you laid your dead relationships? Where is your dead faith? Jesus wants to know where you laid it down so he can bring it back to life tonight. Yeah, but they've already kicked me out of my house. They've already let me go from my job. And we've already filed for a divorce. It's already been diagnosed cancer. You're too late, God. All of my bridges are burned. I'm at the end of my rope. And that's when God says, good, now you can take hold of my hand. You see, friends, it wasn't until I reached the end of my rope that I reached out and took the hand of my God. And so while Mary and Martha and Jairus were planning a funeral procession, Jesus was planning a resurrection. You see, Jesus' plans for your life and for, and for this planet and for your situation are always better than your plans for your life. We can lose everything, but if we still have Jesus, we have everything that we need. Amen? Amen? And that's why not only does God often wait until it's too late, he often wait, waits until it's not enough. You're only a shepherd boy. You can't go up against the Goliath. We only have three loaves and two fish. That's not enough to feed all these people. I only have a cup of flour and a teaspoon of oil. That's not enough. That's just one last meal for me and my son, and then we're going to die. But friends, we need to understand something tonight. Our onlys are enough for God. Our onlys are enough for God. And that's why when Gideon had 32,000 men to fight... In Judges 7, 2, the Lord says to Gideon, the people with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hand, lest Israel boast over me, saying, my own hand saved me. 10,000 men. God says that's still too much. Israel will try to take credit. It isn't until God has them whittled down to just 300 that God says, okay, now I'll give you my strength. You see, the moment we say it is impossible is when God steps in and does the impossible. Friends, when when God is in the equation, when God is in the equation, nothing is impossible. It's when we realize we don't have enough that God steps in and we find out that with God we always have enough. You see, tonight we need to understand something that we we don't have enough power. We don't have enough talent. We don't have enough money. We don't have enough righteousness. But hallelujah, Jesus does. In 2 Peter 1.3 it says his divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. I want you to say, repeat after me, I already have everything I need. That was a little pitiful, let's do it again. 
I already have everything that I need. You see, tonight, friends, God wants to connect you to something deeper and stronger than anything you, ha you can possibly imagine. God wants to connect you to something that is deeper and stronger than just a rescue or an intervention. In John 11, 23 through 24, Jesus says to her, your brother will rise again. Martha says to him, well, I know he's going to rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Check it out. Martha is a good Seventh-day Adventist. <laughs> yeah, isn't this just like an Adventist, you know? Here's the, here is the word of truth. Here is the spirit of prophecy. And Martha's giving Jesus the resurrection and the life a lesson on the state of the dead. Martha's a good seventh-day Adventist. She's lecturing Jesus on theology, but notice, Jesus corrects her. We talked about this last night. Don't limit what God can do. Don't put your transformation on layaway. Notice what he says to her. He says, he says I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. See, church, we need to understand something that the resurrection is not primarily a time and place, but it is primarily a person named Jesus Christ. You see, the reason why that great resurrection day is great is because Jesus Christ is coming with a shout that wakes the dead. It is the presence of the resurrection in the life that makes the resurrection possible. The resurrection is primarily a person, and his name is Jesus. Friends, our faith needs to be in who God is and not just what God can do for us. Our faith has to be built on a relationship and not a result. I see too many Christians or people who identify as Christians who base their, 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 their faith on a result instead of a relationship. But if you base your faith on a result, then you will never be able to handle what's coming this way. In the book of Hebrews, God gives us the type of faith we need in order to handle the difficult, sometimes brutal moments in life. If you have this, you can handle anything. If you don't have this, you won't be able to handle anything. So in Hebrews 11, we have what's been called Faith's Hall of Fame. In Hebrews 11, it goes through all of these heroes, all of these people in Faith's Hall of Fame. And, and there's these incredible heroes of faith, people like Moses and Enoch and Noah and Abraham. And every single verse begins with two words, by faith. By faith they overcame these odds. By faith they achieved these great things. By faith. Notice it says, by faith, these people overthrew kingdoms. They ruled with justice and they received what God had promised them. They shut the mouths of lions. Daniel is thrown into the lion's den. He's thrown into a den full of hungry lions. And people don't survive that. But because of Daniel's faith, he does. And then we continue in Hebrews 11.34, it says there were those who quenched the flames of fire and they escaped death by the edge of the sword. Weakness was turned to strength, they became strong in battle and put whole armies to, fl to flight. This story, this line, quench the flames of fire, is referring to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who are thrown into a raging, fiery furnace. And not only do they survive, but not a single hair is singed. In fact, the Bible says they don't even smell like smoke. That's some incredible faith. And then we get to verse 35. It says, by faith, women received their dead by resurrection. And the widow of Zarephath and the Shunammite woman get their children back. It is the ultimate miracle in Faith's Hall of Fame. And what better end to a story than for a child to be returned to their parents' arms. 
I mean, we love stories like that. We love, and and these stories resonate with us because, you see, we want to believe that God can shut the mouths of lions in our lives. We want to believe that our faith is fireproof. We want to believe that our faith is so strong that it can perform miracles in the people that we love. But friends, this is the thing. If your understanding of faith stops here, you're in in for some serious trouble. If your idea of faith is that if I believe hard enough, if I pray hard enough, if I am just obedient enough, everything will work out. God will answer my prayer. God will always intervene right in the nick of time. If that is your idea of faith today, you're doomed. In fact, you're going to be twice as miserable as everyone else. Well, because you're going to be miserable because it happened... And you're going to be miserable because it happened to you. And you're like, Lord, I was following you. Why is this happening to me? Johnny Erickson Tata, when she was 18 years old, dove into the shallow water of the Chesapeake Bay. She broke her neck, completely paralyzed, a quadriplegic, 18 years old and paralyzed from the neck down. And in her book, she tells the story of how her well-meaning but misguided friends told her that if her faith was strong enough, if it was great enough, that she could be healed. But if her faith wasn't strong enough, she wouldn't be healed. You see, friends, their understanding of faith was that if I have enough of it, everything will just work out. Their hope was grounded in a result instead of in a relationship. They were following God for what he could do instead of for who he was. But friends, Job is a reminder that we can lose everything and still be God's treasure. Amen? (laughs) Fortunately for Johnny Erickson and us today, Hebrews 11 does not end with the beginning of verse 35. It continues with one word, others, others. There are others who believed. There are others who had faith. There are others who trusted in God and yet God did not intervene. In Acts 12, Peter is arrested. He's shackled in prison. He's got two guards sleeping on both sides of him. But because the church prays, because his friends pray, because he prays, man, a miracle takes place. An angel shows up and busts him out of prison. But remember, there are others. There are others, people like James, the brother of John, who at the very beginning of this chapter in Acts 12 has already been identified as having been killed because of his faith. You see, there are others, people like John the Baptist, who went into prison, whose disciples prayed, but he wasn't delivered. Instead of being rescued for his faith, he was executed for his faith. What about the story of King David? David is the ultimate rags to riches story. Man, David was the runt of the family. His own dad didn't believe in him. But because of David's faith, he conquers lions and giants and bears. Oh my. Everyone wants to be like David. Everyone wants to be like, if my faith is good enough, I can defeat the Goliaths in my life. We all want to be like David, but you see there are others. There are people like Jonathan. Jonathan was the son of a king. Jonathan had nobility. Jonathan had courage. Jonathan had honor. Jonathan had character. He was a great warrior. 
He had the best education that money could buy. But because he was faithful, not only did he not become king, he lost everything and he died young in a battle far from home. You see, David trusted in God and everything seemed to work out. Jonathan trusted in God and nothing seemed to work out. And then finally we have the widow of Zarephath and the Shunammite woman. These two awesome stories in the Old Testament, they receive their children back by resurrection. It is the ultimate rescue. It is the ultimate intervention. But the author of Hebrews very quickly reminds us, but there are others. There are mothers and fathers throughout the history of Christianity who did not get their children back. Mothers, others who were tortured, not accepting their deliverance. They were stoned. They were sawn in two, they were tempted, they were put to death with the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted. They were ill-treated. Men of whom the world was not worthy, wandering in deserts and mountains and caves and holes in the ground. These people lost everything, but they never lost hope. That's the kind of faith we need today. In his book, The American Dream, the author, Andrew Del Banco, looks at three phases of American history. And he explains how more so than any era in in, in our history, our generation right now is the worst at handling hardship. And he goes through what is the reason You know, and the reason ultimately is why today's generation, and that's not pointing fingers at any specific generation, that's everybody who's in this room today. The reason why we're we're often so bad at handling hardship in this society today is that throughout history, people have lived for something bigger than themselves. So... Used to people live for God. That was something that transcended the pain. That was something that transcended the problems. And then there was a time where people lived for country. The country was important. We just got done celebrating uh, Memorial Day, recognizing, observing Memorial Day. And and there was a time where country uh, was important and that transcended their problems. It transcended their pain. It was believing something bigger than themselves. But in today's day, we live for self. The problem is when you live for yourself, you believe in nothing that can transcend the problems and the pain. More so than ever before, friends, we need godly faith. We need to believe in something bigger than ourselves. We need to recognize that church is not about us, it's about reaching the community. The church is not about what you want. It's about what God wants. And we got to believe and and, and instill this reality in our kids that the greatest reality, the most successful thing they can do is to fall in love with God and to believe in something bigger than themselves. We need a faith that transcends our problems. When you live for self, you don't have anything that can transcend your pain or problem. So the question is, how did these others remain faithful? How did these others remain faithful even when their faith would not spare them the grave, but actually takes them directly into the grave? Well, Hebrews gives us it in two words. A better resurrection. You see, friends, as wonderful as it was for the widows to get their sons back, 
As wonderful as it was for Jairus to get his daughter back, as wonderful as it was for Martha and Mary to have Lazarus back, you see, death had only been postponed. They were still susceptible to diseases, depression, darkness. As wonderful as these miracles were, they were still only temporary solutions. In the chapter right after Lazarus is brought back to life, we have the triumphal entry. And notice what it says. It says that the crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb, raised him from the dead, continued to bear witness. The reason, notice, the reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they had heard that he had done this sign. You see, friends, they're just going to God to get stuff. We've got to have a faith that doesn't go to God to get stuff. Instead, we need to go to God just to get more God. You see, for them, it was all about the temporary. Heal the sick, feed the hungry, raise the dead. Often our prayers are often only focused on the temporary. Lord, I need you to bless my finances. Lord, I need you to salvage my relationship. Lord, I need you to heal my son and daughter. And look, I want to be clear. We want to bring all of our requests to God. We want to pray for those things. But don't be surprised when God does not answer the prayer the way you wanted him to. Because instead of going to a throne, Jesus goes to a cross. Instead of getting crowned, Jesus goes and gets himself killed. You see, sometimes our expectations can turn into resentments. And suddenly, our hosannas turn into crucify him. And suddenly, we stop waving palm branches and we start waving our fists. Friends, our hope and faith has to be grounded in something bigger and better. Our hope and faith has to be grounded in who He is and not in what He can do for me. You know, when people come up to me and they'll say, Pastor, I'm giving up on this God thing. When people say to me, you know what, Pastor, I prayed so long to God and he didn't come through for me. I trusted him, but he failed me. I as gently as I can tell them, no, God did not fail you. God didn't fail you. Your plans for God failed you. But God did not fail you. You didn't trust in God. You trusted in your agenda for God. But friends, the others in Hebrews 11, they put their faith in something bigger and better than just a temporary solution. They cultivated such a deep satisfaction in God that they knew that he was better than anything this world could give them or take away from them. And that's the type of hope and faith that even death cannot steal. That's the type of hope and faith that can transcend the problems of life. Notice, all these people earned a good reputation because of their faith, yet none of them received all that God had promised. God had something better in mind for us so that they would not reach perfection without us. Friends, what this is basically saying is that if the others in Hebrews 11 went through all that pain just for a promise, then we should have even more faith because that promise has come true in the person of Jesus Christ. You see, if Isaiah was sawn in half for a promise, then I can allow my schedule to get sawn in half for the person of Jesus Christ. If Jonathan was forsaken for a promise, then I can be forsaken for the person of Jesus. If, if Elijah stood alone on Mount Carmel for a promise, I can stand alone uh, for the person of Jesus Christ. And you want to know what is so amazing about the gospel, what is so amazing about Jesus is that when he came to this earth, when he became flesh and blood and moved into our neighborhood, he did not come identifying with the first group of Hebrews 11 where God swooped in and saved him in the nick of time. No. 
When Jesus came, he didn't identify with the first group in Hebrews, the ones that were rescued. He rather chose to identify with the second group of Hebrews 11. He was tortured, not accepting deliverance. He had a trial of mockings and scourgings. People cried out, but no angel appeared to release him. No chariot of fire swooped in to rapture him. No one stood in the fire with Jesus. Jesus was completely and totally forsaken. He was born in a borrowed room. And he was murdered and buried in a borrowed tomb. Why? Friends, to give you a better resurrection. After the resurrection, the first thing Jesus shows to the disciples are his scars. It's the first thing that he does. Do you know why? This is why I believe Jesus shows the disciples his scars. Because when the disciples watched the nails go into his hands, they thought their lives were over. You see, those nails had ruined their plans. We know what their plans were. James and John wanted to be on the left side and the right side. They were all lobbying and politicking to be a part of this movement that was going to rule the world. And when they saw those nails go into Christ's hands, their plans were ruined. And, ruined. and so they, they choked and they denied him and suddenly they disappeared. But friends, this is what's really cool. The very thing they thought had ruined their lives was the very thing that was saving their lives. The very thing they thought was a sign that God had deserted them became the very sign that God had loved them like none other. You see, friends, without the crucifixion, there is no resurrection. And just because you do not see anything good coming out of your current situation, just because you cannot see anything good coming out of that tragedy that you're going through right now, just because you don't see anything good coming out of that situation doesn't mean that it can't. Calvary is proof of that. You've got to hold on. Hallelujah. We have a promise of a better resurrection. You see, in the better resurrection, we don't just get people back temporarily. We get people back for eternity. We just, this is what's so cool about the better resurrection, is we don't just get it back. We get it back, but better. So we get the body back, but this time without the arthritis, better. We get our family back, but this time without the disease, better. We get our parents back, but this time without the depression, better. We get our kids back, but this time without the addiction, better. We get the planet back, but without the pollution and the politician, better. We get life back, but this time without death. Hallelujah, I want to be ready for the better resurrection. What about you? And John 1.15 says that the light shines in the darkness and the darkness will not overcome it. And if you know this, you can handle anything the enemy throws at you. It may not be easy to go through what you're going through. There is no problem-free clause in your Christianity contract. Problems. When you became a Christian, you signed up for problems. Because the moment you gave your life to Christ, the devil put a target on your back. And the more you step out in faith to live God's purpose and plan for your life, the more the enemy is going to attack you and he's going to attack your family. But you hold on. Hallelujah. Better resurrection is coming. On the day everything sad comes untrue, all that pain that you went through will only make your joy greater. I want you to think about that. You will find that the worst things that happened in this life, that the moment you rise in that better resurrection, it will only enhance your eternal life. When God turns it 
all of it inside out, you will come to know a joy beyond the walls of this world. You see, friends, Jesus is saying to each of us today, embrace me and every death will eventually lead to resurrection. Every failure will eventually lead to victory. Everything wrong will eventually be made right. Every sorrow will eventually turn to gold. You see, God's got something planned better than resuscitation or a temporary solution or just a minor intervention. Hallelujah, Jesus has one plan and it's called a better resurrection. You see, this is why I believe Jesus shows up at Lazarus' funeral late because he had a better plan than just intervention. He was planning resurrection. This is why I believe when Jesus shows up at Lazarus' funeral, he never gives Mary and Martha consolation. You know, that's what we do, you know, whenever we see someone as a pastor, I've had to do way too many funerals, and the best thing that we can do is tell people, I'm sorry for your loss. The only thing we can do is give people consolation, but hallelujah, my Jesus can do one better than that, so he does not offer Mary and Martha consolation, no, he offers them resurrection. Friends, today Christ is offering you something better than consolation, better than temporary solution, better than intervention. It is called a better resurrection. And let me tell you, that better resurrection is better than any big bank balance. It is better than that big house. It is better than anything you can ever imagine. It is a better resurrection. And on that day, when all the sadness is swallowed whole by Christ's triumphant coming, hallelujah, when death is swallowed up in victory, all the pain and loss of this life will instantly be swallowed up with the joy of eternal life with Christ our King. When Lazarus came out of the grave... He had his burial linens on. They were wrapped around him. They had to remove them. You see, Lazarus would need his burial linens again because he would die again. But notice that when Jesus comes out of the tomb, he leaves his burial linens in the grave. Because you see, hallelujah, because of Christ, he does not need burial linens anymore. And one day, because of Jesus, we won't need burial linens anymore either. Oh, because of the better resurrection. Check this out. For as by man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ, the first fruits, and then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. It's a better resurrection. In John eleven forty three, 43, it says that he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. Did you know this Greek word for cried out? It appears in the entire Bible only eight times. And six of those times are in John when the people cry out, crucify him. Crucify him. Don't you see, friends, when the world shouts, it leads to death. But when Jesus shouts, it leads to life. You see, the good news is that Jesus shouts louder than death. His shout is so loud that when he comes, it wakes the dead. In 1 Thessalonians, it says, Our king is coming back with another shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise. Just as Jesus shouted and Lazarus came out at the better resurrection, Jesus is going to shout and hallelujah, all the dead in Christ are going to come out. I'm ready for the better resurrection. What about you? Hallelujah, I am ready for the better resurrection when Jesus puts an end to all the war and strife. Hallelujah, no more funerals. 
No more funerals. No more back pain. No more broken hearts or depression. No more drug addiction. I'm ready for the better resurrection. What about you? No more crooked politicians. No more backstabbing people. No more gossiping Christians. I want to be there. What about you? I want to be there when all the heaven, uh, when, when all of heaven fills the sky and when Christ the King is reflected in every eye, I want to be there. I want to be there when all the paralyzed get up and all the guilt and the shame of this life is tore up. Man, I want to be there when every single frown is turned upside down. I want to be there when no more families break up. And when Michael the archangel finally stands up. And the devil is at last shut up. And all the dead in Christ rise up. And we which are alive and remain are caught up. I want to be there. What about you? A better resurrection is coming. And I don't care what you have in this life, it is not worth eternity. Hold on to the better resurrection that's coming. And on that day, everything sad, everything bad will become radically untrue. Hold on to that better resurrection. When bad times come and when the enemy attacks, and when, when, when bad things happen to us in this life, hold on to that better resurrection. Because hallelujah, he that shall come will come and shall not tarry. Let us pray. Father, we thank you and we praise you for the awesome God that you are. And Lord, right now I pray that you might give us the faith of Hebrews 11. Not just of the first group who, Lord, you stepped in and intervened miraculously. And there's nothing wrong with praying for that miracle. There's nothing wrong with praying for that intervention. But Lord, I pray that we will have faith that goes beyond that. That we will have the faith of the second group in, 11, in Hebrews 11.35 who did not give up on you even when their world was falling apart because they were holding on to that better resurrection. Lord, I pray that each person here might surrender their lives to you so that they can be a part of that better resurrection. Lord, I pray for each person here, because as we've seen tonight, that that better resurrection is not just a place or a time, but rather it is ultimately found in the person of Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, I pray if there's anybody here who's been, been, been back and forth in their decision and they need to surrender all to you, I pray right now in the quietness of their own hearts and mind, Lord, that they will receive you into their life and they will say, all to Jesus I surrender. That they will not put off salvation, for today is the day of salvation. Lord, I pray that each, each person here might rededicate their life to you. And that we will step out of this place as new people because we have been with Jesus. And Lord, that we can be confident of this very thing, that he who began the good work in us will continue it. And hallelujah, if you begin a good work in us, Philippians 1.6 says you're going to finish that good work in us at the day of Jesus Christ. Lord, we long for that day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen.